So I guess this is the, I hope everyone can hear us on the webinar. I'm assuming that we've started now. Um, thanks everyone uh, for those who could, who could make it, who could join us. Um, so just to let you know where um, IDPC arranged a number of webinars for mo each region, most regions of the world. Um, and it's to do a bit of a share, raise awareness about the upcoming UN General Assembly special session on the world drug problem. Um, so we wanted to do this webinar to raise awareness about why is it important, um, why is it happening now, um, and why it's so important for civil society to be engaged um, in, the, in the lead up to it. Um, we also wanted to outline, talk with you about some of the, the processes and the opportunities for engagement as well. Um, so we have joining with us here today is the Executive Director of the International Drug Policy Consortium and Fordham um, to give us some background and highlight some of the key issues and opportunities for engagement for civil society in the lead up to ANGAS. Um, we also have Juan from SCDR in Vietnam, which is one of two members uh, representing the region of Southeast Asia as part of the ANGAS Civil Society Task Force. And this ANGAS Civil Society Task Force will also be explained a bit um, in Anne and Juan's presentation as well. And we also have Simon, if you're able to join. I'm um, still not on yet, but I'm hoping you can join us later. One or two representatives for South Asia um, from on the ANGAS Civil Society Task Force. And Simon works for, uh, is from Alliance India. Um, so I'll just pass this time on to, to Anne now. Hi, Hi. Good afternoon, Hi. Everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this um, webinar on the ANGAS. Uh, this is our Asian colleague. Um, so, Juan, I, uh, sorry, Juan, I assume that you, yeah, um, did Gloria already mention this around the comments and questions that you can enter this into live chat? Oh, no, I didn't. And, um, and then we'll, we'll try to respond to questions. Um, basically at the end of each um, section. So please feel free to ask questions or, or um, make comments. But yeah, we'll try and respond to any questions that you have. And also you can tweet um, about the webinar or tweet questions if you use the hashtag IDPC webinar. We'll also be tracking that hashtag and making sure that um, we're picking up any questions on Twitter as well. So yeah, we've got it. So this webinar will take about an hour um, until 5 p.m. Uh, Bangkok time. Okay, so one, I think we can start the Yeah, so next I mean what one one is doing that I'll um chart. So basically those you who don't know um, IDPC, they are a global network of just over 150 years and um, gather to advocate for them objective debate in international drug policy. Um, we kind of work at two levels. We basically in it support our civil society partners and that have a voice within our international policy, also at the region and also no. My uh, voice is breaking. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know. Is that better? Can people hear me? Yeah, is that better? Okay. Um, and sorry, I can't see, I can't see the, the slides moving. But that's fine. Okay. And um, so we support society to engage in, in constructive ways. And then we also engage directly with government, providing policy analysis, advice, and support around the processes. Um, so then, yeah, so that's a nice picture of you see our member meeting at the CND two years ago, and also you'll see there we're all support, support don't punish campaign, which you may have heard about, um, with global campaign to kind of draw attention to the, the war on drugs and the failure of the war on drugs. Okay, so next slide, we'll move to the IS. Um so the, the UNGAS, or the UN Assembly Special Session on Drugs, will take place in New York in April of this year, on the 19th to the 20th of April. Um, 
and we're going to go through very quickly now why it's, why it's an important moment, why there has been so much attention focused on it, um, and why it's a critical moment for society to really engage in the, in the drug policy debates. So, on the next slide, um, why drugs in 2016? Um, so, this has really come about because. Um, sorry. Because yeah, sorry, struggling to hear. Can you can you can you all hear me now? It's still the same. Sorry, I don't really know. Um, what else we could do? Was Gloria's book? They okay. apparently your computer worked fine. They apparently your computer worked fine. They apparently your computer worked fine. And I'm going to turn off from you. Hello again, everyone. Can you hear me now? I'm so sorry about that. OK. Obviously, there's something wrong with my computer. It's a little unhappy. So I was just talking about the young gas. <laughs> um, starting to talk about the young gas, trying to talk about the young gas. Um, so why drugs in 2016 and, and why do we care that something's happening at the UN General Assembly? So if we move on to the slide on the um, international drug control structures, um, you'll see that the reason why the General Assembly is important is that it's the highest policy making body in within the UN. Um, so it sits above all, all the other Drug the, the, the main drug control um, body, which is the CND, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. Um, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs sits above the UNODC, which is actually the implementing agency um, for global drug policy. And then it also sits above the ECOSOC, which is the Economic and Social Council, which is where decisions taken by the CND have to go to get approval. Decision, those decisions still have to come to the General Assembly for approval. So the fact that this debate's happening at the General Assembly is incredibly important and has a lot of weight. The other point about it is that um, the CND, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, there are only 53 member states who are members of the CND and are able to um, make decisions vote, etc., in that forum, whereas the General Assembly includes all UN member states. So it's about having a much broader debate and discussion at the highest level. So that's why we see that it's incredibly important. Um, the other point to make is that, um, next slide please, that um, the last UNGAS on drugs was in 1998. Um, so it's actually been um, nearly 20 years, 18 years since the last UNGAS on drugs, um, and 18 years since they really had a debate at the highest level in the UN about the state of global drug policy. So that's another reason why we've put so much emphasis on it. And you'll also see there from that slide that um, in terms of UN General Assembly um, special sessions, there are different special sessions on different issues um, of, of, of importance to the global community. And some of you who work in HIV AIDS may also be aware that um, there was that you know there have been also UN General Assembly special sessions on HIV AIDS, and I think the most recent one was 2011. So so it's an important moment. Next slide, please. Um, just to return again to the previous UNGAS in 1998, the slogan, um, the UN slogan at that UNGAS was a drug-free world. We can do it. And um, we, yeah, well, you can see that nice poster there. That was one of the posters from the from the previous um, UNGAS um, in 1998. Um, it's not by um, accident that they have this slogan. And although they've actually dropped the slogan, the global goals around drug control still remain around basically eradication. So you'll see there on that slide. Um, in, in 2009, there was basically a review of the progress being made towards um, 
the global goal of eradicating the world of drugs, basically. Um, and they didn't have an ungas. They had a they had a high level meeting, um, which was the point of review in 2009. And but at, in 2009, they basically restated the same goals and basically gave themselves another 10-year deadline. So in 1998, they gave themselves a deadline of 2008 for a drug-free world. And then in 2009, they basically reaffirmed that goal and gave themselves another 10 years. So you'll see there, eradicate or significantly reduce the global drug market by 2019. The other thing that happened, and this is um, important for the... Um, is, this is important for, for understanding the, 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 what I'll talk about towards the end of the webinar around what might be gained for the young gas. At that point as well, they agreed that drug control should be structured under three pillars, which was demand reduction, supply reduction, and then um, money laundering and judicial cooperation was the third pillar. Gloria, you can take that question later. So then um, 2014, um, there was a five-year review of the new plan that they agreed. Sorry, can we go back? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, just my point there, the bit in yellow, is just to make the point that I feel like these reviews that they have about the progress that, that that's being made are not entirely honest. And actually, the assessment at that time, in 2014, the, the UN speak, if you like, um, in terms of looking at the progress that they've made towards this goal of eradication or significantly reducing the drug market because they couldn't really say anything about those things because they haven't significantly reduced the drug market and we certainly haven't moved towards eradication. Um, but they framed it as, we have made significant progress towards still distant goals. So you can see how, they, how, how they're very good at reframing things to say that there was still progress being made, although we would argue that that progress is, um, yeah, not really, um, not really there. So the next big moment would have been 2019 because that's the end of the current political declaration and action plan agreed in 2009. But the young gas, as I mentioned, was brought forward. Um, that, mo that big political moment was brought forward by three years. And why was it brought forward? Um, next slide, please. Um, the young gas was actually called for in um, 2012 by the presidents of Mexico, Guatemala, and Colombia. And they felt there was a need to urgently open up the debate on drug control and that we couldn't afford to wait until 2019, the end of the current political declaration and action plan. They took their proposal to the General Assembly and 95 other UN member states supported their proposal to have an UNGAS in 2016. Um, so, why, why did these presidents feel that this issue is urgent? Um, you know, Latin America has borne some of the highest costs of repressive and punitive drug control policies as it's currently constructed. You know, Mexico, since 2007, has counted over 100,000 um, drug-related deaths, homicides, in relation to um, violence associated with the drug market. And that violence has largely been driven by a government response that became very violent in under Philippe Calderon, the previous um, president of Mexico, in 2007. So the violence has spiraled out of control, but largely because the government became violent and the criminal gangs then also responded with violence. Um, so for them, it's an urgent issue because they've felt a lot of pressure, particularly from the US, to end the drug trade at source, and it's uh, no longer sustainable for them. And we also know that Latin America has experienced high levels of incarceration, um, locking up many people for many low-level non-violent drug offenses, and increasingly, we know that that's a problem in this region, and that's something that some governments in this region are starting to talk about reluctantly, but they're having to because their prisons are so full. Um, and I think the UNGAS, since the UNGAS was, was requested in 2012, we've seen an increasing number of member states at the CND, at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, at the UN, kind of express their displeasure with the international drug control system as it currently stands, you know, um, talk about the need for an approach that's much stronger, but more strongly based in human rights and more strongly based in, in public health principles, for example. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, sorry. I'm so... Just some context in terms of where, how this UNGAS is taking place. Next slide, please. Um, 
some of you may be aware that, um, and we say to, since 2009 because obviously that was the last, when the last political declaration was agreed, we've had the Global Commission on Drug Policy that some of you might be aware of, um, headed up by um, President Cardoso, ex-president of Brazil. Richard Branson also sits on this group. Kofi Annan sits on this group. Ruth Dreyfus, you see there in the picture, she's the ex-president of Switzerland. And they basically have been calling for the reform of international drug control. And because these sort of high-profile people have come out and said that the war on drugs needs to end, I think that's given more political space and cover for member states to come out and, and, and say this as well. Next slide, please. So globally as well, there's a, there's been a trend, an increasing trend, and this is not just since 2009. This has been for you know, say the last 25 years really, um, a number of member states moving towards decriminalizing drug use and possession for personal use. It's not an even approach, as in it can be different according to different member states, but there are many countries, over 40 countries and jurisdictions we can count where some form of decriminalization has been implemented. So it's not some new innovative approach, it's um, becoming more established. Next slide, please. The other development that you may be aware of is around cannabis reform, um, particularly in the United States. and also in Uruguay, but um, this slide is about the US and we know that, you may know the, the often cited examples of Washington and Colorado, um, they basically had um, kind of state level referendum where the people in the state voted to create state, uh, sorry, state level cannabis markets for recreational use and you'll see there the views in the US around whether or not marijuana should be legalized have changed drastically um, over the last 40 years and increasingly we're going to see probably more states in addition to the ones who have current already joined the um, recreational cannabis market movement if you like um, more and more states will do, do so at state level in, in the US and that's a game changer because the US position has always been quite tough and strict so now for them to have states that are regulating cannabis this does change the picture globally um, and then moving on quickly around the mass incarceration issue that I mentioned um, in the US the US has you know 5% of the world's population 25% of the world's prisoners and there is a recognition that um, they can't incarcerate them their way out of this problem. So the ex-Attorney General Eric Holder um, made this statement. Yeah, I don't know if we're on the next slide or not. Um, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, too many Americans go to too many prisons for far too long and for no truly good law enforcement reason. We cannot simply prosecute prosecute or incarcerate our way um, to becoming a safer country. And there's a recognition that, that over-incarceration has not created a safer country, but actually made it less safe. So last year, um, Barack Obama pardoned um, around um, 6,000 federal drug offenders. And under his initiative to do this, there's a plan to um, well, about 40,000 more people will um, will benefit, 40,000 federal prisoners will benefit from this move to reduce incarceration and, and commute sentences for people who've been given very, very, um, you're going to respond to that in your section. Um, Sorry, and then the next slide, please. I think this is important. This this next statistic on the on the next slide, because this is this is really creating a discussion at the Young Gas. You know, um, UNODC estimates that since 2004, the global prison population has increased by around 10 percent, and they also told us in 2014 from their data that around one in five people sentenced to pr to, pr to prison globally is for a drug offence. Um, that alone is shocking, but the more shocking part of that is that 80% of those who are incarcerated for drug offences is for a possession offence alone. So they're not even in prison for anything more than possessing drugs. There's no indication that they were selling, dealing, or involved in any trading activities. So who are we putting in our prisons for drug offences? And that's a question that, that, thankfully, some member states are now asking. So I'm now going to hand over to Gloria. 
Um, she's also going to try and answer one of the first questions we've received, which is okay. how do we perceive the role of ASEAN in addressing the war on drugs in the region? Um, so I'm going to hand over to Gloria. Next slide. So if we see just in the past decade or so in Asia generally, I think it's generally applicable in South Asia and Southeast Asia, Asia you see some in some in many in several countries a shift towards greater support for harm reduction um, and at least in the rhetoric the need for a shift towards a health approach to drug use we hear often the slogans particularly in Southeast Asia that drug users are patients not criminals um, that is of course not an accurate slogan because most people who use drugs are not sick and are not in need of treatment but this is just to illustrate the approach that several governments in at least in Southeast and, and East Asia have taken um, in their policies toward drug use. Um, and the, but the problem is that overwhelmingly governments take a, a punitive approach to drug use. So you see prevalent in the region, drug use is of course still a criminal offence um, in most countries in the region. And most people who are caught using drugs can be sent to prison uh, for up to, up to several years. And then you see a range of other um, punitive approaches that are supposedly in the name of health or rehabilitation, and that's namely compulsory detention for drug use. Then you also get corporal punishment in some countries, such as Singapore and Malaysia. Forced urine testing is also really popular. Um, compulsory registration with security agencies um, is also something that is commonly seen. For other drug-related activities, you also see harsh punishment and very disproportionate punishment in Asia. Most of the countries, there are a very small number of countries that retain the death, the death penalty for drug offences in, in the world, um, but those that are remaining, most of them, those countries, are in Asia. And in the past few years, we've seen some shifts, some amendments to policies to reduce the use of the death penalty for drug offences. Late last year, for example, Vietnam abolished the death penalty for a number of drug offences. Um, we see concerns that are, have been raised in, in Thailand, for example, about the, about the high rates of incarceration of people, not just for drug use, but for low-level, for minor drug offences. Um, and so you see so, some concerns noted in those areas, but overwhelmingly what we have in the region is still um, severely disproportionate punishment for all drug-related activities. I guess this is probably most starkly illustrated by ASEAN last year when they had their annual, their annual meetings at the senior official and ministerial level. A lot of us um, observers and civil society advocates were wondering what ASEAN's stance would be given that their goal was to achieve a drug-free region by 2015. Clearly, even before the year ended, we, everyone knew and all the data shows that they are nowhere near achieving that goal and, and in fact indicators all show that for every single type of area from use to, to production to trafficking that the engage in all these is, is, in, is increasing, is not decreasing. And so given that context, what, how would ASEAN governments would, will react? Um, and unfortunately the way that they reacted was just to dig in their heels and to reaffirm that they are standing for a drug-free region. Um, and at the ministerial meeting late last year, ASEAN countries agreed to take a unified stance for UNGAS, um, saying, pledging to a number of key issues, um, and firstly that the ASEAN countries would remain committed to a zero-tolerance approach to drug policy, and that they would continue striving to achieve a drug-free region, but that they would insist on the sovereign right of countries around the world may be um, increasingly adopted such as decriminalized countries um, and right okay and I think I'll just leave that there for now and one the questions. yeah kind of, oh, I think the other question we answer it now or answer it later well, because you're talking about ASEAN, I think you should answer writing that question. Beyond, I think on the second question, well, yeah, I asked about, I answered the question about ASEAN. Thanks for that first question. I think it was from Greg. 
the second question, maybe I'll leave it to to one, um, Simon or Anne, to answer. Um, and on the third question, on you might need to read them out so then people know which questions you're referring to. Okay, one, the third one. How can okay? There was also a question here about how can civil society networks such as IDPC facilitate the assertive participation of governments in the Asian region? Um, I think that's a really complex question um, because at the moment, if it, what would you ideally well for advocates for drug policy reform, we would like governments in Asia to speak out in support of reform. But what, all that we have seen so far is that that is very that at the at the last um, CND intercessional in December, countries that clearly are taking a leadership role in the region, like Singapore and Indonesia, stood up and said that they have the sovereign right to do um, to implement whatever measures that they considered necessary in response to drugs, including the death the use of the death penalty, um, and they insisted on their sovereign right. Um, and that issue such as proportionality of punishment for drug offences was something that remained in the purview of countries and that this is not something that should be imposed upon other countries. Um, I'm just worried that we're not leaving enough time for one and Simon. So I'm, I'm going, I think for the other questions, can we try to address it at, at the end by um, one, one of amongst us? But just to finish at that point on that is to think about whether how you would like your country, the ways in which you've engaged, you could with is writing to your government, starting a relationship, some type of dialogue with your government, um, identifying the relevant people, the relevant ministries. They could be from the ministry, your Mon ministry of foreign affairs. Um, people, delegations to CND and, and UNGAS could be quite broad. Um, they could come from the health ministry, the the ministry is responsible for HIV in addition to respon uh, ministries responsible for drugs and for policing and law enforcement. So I think map out your, stake your stakeholders and then try to initiate some type of dialogue and contact with them and find out who is working on the CND and UNGAS portfolio this year. I'll just hand back to Anne for now. Thanks, Gloria. That was um, really useful. And so I'm just going to quickly do uh, five minutes now on what we might gain from the young gases and the current state of play in terms of the political debates in, in Vienna. And then we'll hand over to Simon and Juan, um, and they will each kind of talk 10 minutes um, about the work in their region, which I'll explain just before I introduce them. So what might we, we gain? I mean, actually, governments have been discussing the UNGAS for, for the last three years. And I think the point that Gloria has just made in response to your question, um, you know, we also have to be a little bit tactical about the young gas itself, and you know, we have been quite worried about the, the position of, of many Asian governments, particularly in Southeast Asia, because of their very punitive um, approach. That encouraging them to speak out at the young gas might not be the best strategy, in fact, because they're not actually going to say something progressive. They're going to restate the use of the death penalty. They're going to restate the need to for a drug-free ASEAN. They're going to restate the need to, um, you know, for them to stay true to a punitive approach. So we're trying to think about how to balance that, in fact, with progressive voices from from other member states. So just quickly, what we might gain, because people are feeling a little bit. Um, I think it's important not to be over optimistic about the UNGAS and you know what member states are going to agree there. You know. I mean, um, I did see a question that came up about what, you know, what we are going to do about it as civil society or as IDPC. Of course, you know, we're constantly pushing for drug policy that's based on human rights and public health, and those things are the things that we will push for. But this is a governmental process, and governments will decide um, what the youngest outcome is. And you could be very pessimistic about it, or you could look at the overall um, picture and look at where the landscape has shifted since, say, 1998. So there is a big shift in the rhetoric and in the tone of the discussion. Next slide, please. So for me, this is really important. Again, this relates to the U.S. government position. This, this statement here, declare that people who use drugs should receive support, treatment, and punishment. As punishment. I always make that wrong. Protection rather than be punished. 
This was a statement that the US made in their contribution last June towards the UNGAS outcome document um, under the public health pillar. And for them to make the statement, I think, represents a paradigm shift in how they want drug users to be treated. Um, of course, it's still rhetoric and much needs to happen in terms of actual real change, but real change, I think, has to be led first by rhetoric. So that's, that's important and that, you know, we've been putting pressure on other governments to support the US position on this, which is a very strange position for IDPC and our partners to find ourselves in using the US government's position as an advocacy point. But just to put it in context, this is a really important statement that the US has made and represents a real change in, in moving towards um, the non-punishment of people who use drugs. Next slide, please. So I, I mentioned already before Gloria spoke the prison statistic um, of one in five people being in prison globally for a drug offense, and prisons are incredibly full. Um, just to give you the example of Thailand, um, you know, Thailand is incarcerating people at a frightening rate for drug offences. Um, they, their prison capacity is 140,000 and they currently have around 120 to 180,000 in people in prison. 60 to 70 percent of those are in prison for low-level non-violent drug offences and they also incarcerate women um, at one of the highest rates in the world and 80% of women in prison are for non-violent low-level drug offences. And Thailand is actually having some debate at some levels around how they address this issue and the proportionality of their sentences. And also for the first time we're seeing governments in their submissions for the UNGAS actually putting um, the issue of proportionality of sentences in there. So it's definitely going to be a debate um, a point of debate at the UNGAS and we see that as very important. The European Union have just confirmed that they will be submitting a resolution on the proportionality of sentences for the upcoming CND in March. So again, these are windows of openings towards you know, the general trend around moving away from an overly repressive approach. Next slide please. Um, so access to essential medicines or access to controlled medicines, this is a point which all member states are agreed on that they need to redress the lack of attention that's been paid to the issue of access to control of medicines and the pain epidemic that we're facing in many parts of the world due to overly rigid controls on drugs like morphine. So, um, you know, this is a point where I think we will see some real progress coming out of the UNGAS and a commitment from member states to an action plan around the controlled medicines issue. Um, and finally, um, other areas of debate on the next slide. They will, they will have their usual fight about harm reduction and um, obviously we'll be pushing for them to, to stay strong in that fight. On this slide where I've said expand definition, um, we are encouraging them because it's important to note that for HIV and injecting drug use, we have now accepted language around those interventions. So the comprehensive package as recommended by UNAIDS, UNODC, WHO, that's already in the document, but they never talk about harm reduction for any other types of drug use. And for in this region, around ATS use, for example, or crack use, smoking drugs. So we're trying to encourage that definition to be expanded. Ending the death penalty for drugs offences and stronger human rights language, that will be a fight. The EU has put it as a red line in their position. They want to see the end of the death penalty for drugs offences. Switzerland want to see it. Norway want to see it. You know, and a few other Latin American countries coming out on that. So that will be the tension with many Asian governments and the ASEAN governments in particular that retain the death penalty. We'll see more attention to the development and socio-economic dimension with specific reference, I think, to the recently agreed sustainable development goals. Again, an opportunity and a window. And some discussion that we're also supporting is to for governments to really reassess the indicators by which success is measured. So just measuring how many people you've arrested, put in prison, how many drugs you've seized is not an indication of progress in terms of the health and well-being of mankind, which is supposed to be um, supposed to be um, the yeah the the underlying objective of the international drug control system. Um, so finally, next slide, what's happening right now, the negotiations are taking place. Um, they've been negotiating on, on the outcome document for the last four months. They will meet again in Vienna on the 27th of January to have the next stage of this outcome document. 
um, it is important to note, as I mentioned earlier, the three pillars of supply reduction, demand reduction, and international cooperation. They're now shifting towards a different framework. The first one will be drugs and health, hopefully. It's not yet agreed. Drugs and health, drugs and crime under which criminal justice issues will be placed, um, drugs and human rights and other cross-cutting issues. And it's really important there's a specific mention of human rights at a high level in that document. New challenges under which they're placing things like the new psychoactive substances um, issue, which is a, they see as a major threat. And finally, um, development or alternative development. So that also represents a paradigm shift in the approach. So moving on quickly now to introduce Simon and Juan, because they've been key to the role of civil society in this, um, in this process. So a civil society task force was set up. Um, just about a year ago with strong regional representation and strong thematic representation and balance across the civil society organizations interested in international drug policy or drug policy in general. So we have harm reduction advocates but we also have advocates for prevention. We have um, someone representing people who use drugs and we also have someone representing someone from the pe from the recovery movement, so recovered drug users. We have someone representing um, the access to controlled medicines and pain and palliative care movement. We have someone representing subsistence farmers. So it's been a really diverse um, and constructive process. And in this region, we've been really lucky to have um, two strong civil society reps. So in, in Southeast Asia, from, from, from I mean, there's been two in each region. So in Southeast Asia, there's actually two. There's one from SCDI, who will speak in a moment and um, Duke from the Mayor Falun Foundation. And then in South Asia, it's been uh, Simon from a Alliance India, who will speak in a moment. And then um, I think it's Pupadu from Nepal, um, uh, sorry, from Sri Lanka. Um, and in each region, these regional reps have been conducting consultation with civil society in their regions to pull together the civil society contribution from the from a regional perspective that will be fed into the civil society task force and then be submitted as part of the young gas process um, the other very quick thing to mention is that there will be a civil there will be a stakeholder consultation on the 10th of february in new york um, for those of you wanting to attend the deadline for registration is today and that's really the big civil society moment um, where civil society will get to speak to member states um, about what they their main concerns um, in reference to um, international drug policy and the future of international drug policy and what's working and perhaps what's not working so well. So also to, you don't necessarily need to be there, I think it's going to be streamed online as well and the report of the proceedings will be a formal report into the young gas process. So, um, and we're going to answer all questions at the end to ensure that Simon and Juan get time and I think they now have about eight minutes each to leave time for questions. So um, I think Juan is going next. I'll hand over to Juan. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, Okay, so I am one of the two representatives um, of Southeast Asia and it's Asia in civil society task force, and just want to quickly to um, to speak to you about the the consultation process and and the outcome um, so far, um, or the or the output so far. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, for this region, we um, we started first with the with a face-to-face -face consultation um, organized by IDPC um, during the International Harm Reduction Conference in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia in October. Um, actually, before this consultation, um, the Civil Society Task Force uh, had a global uh, consultation, online consultation, um, and um, that link has been sent to many organization and there are a uh, lot of uh, civil society organization have given the input um, responded to the consultation um, that when that came into a report from civil society task force to um, to the um, 
to the UN. Um, and in this region, we have that consultation in KL in October. And after the consultation, we continue with an online consultation. So um, we uh, compose a list of NGOs um, in the region um, that we, we uh, took from the uh, UNODC website. So in, OD in on the UNODC website for each country, they have a list of NGOs and we try to send email to those NGOs and we also try to um, contact other NGOs and civil society organizations in the region um, and ask them to give input to the five teams um, of the UNGAS uh, document that Anne just mentioned. Um, so based on that, um, we um, then uh, draft a submission, a regional submission, like a paper, um, uh, summarize the input from our region um, to send to the civil society task force. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we have, uh, um, we got the input from 37 organizations in eight countries, um, and um, Almost everyone who responded to the online consultation also gave feedback to the draft regional submission. So now at the moment we have a, a draft of the regional submission and I saw an, um, a question earlier that um, if it is um, still um, submit a writing on view and recommendation from national CSO to towards UNCAS 2016, um, the answer is yes. Um, but it had to be today because the deadline for regional submission is um, in is the day after tomorrow. So if you have something in writing that you would like to be incorporated in the regional submission, um, please do send to me um, as soon as possible. Um, today is the best, otherwise early tomorrow then I can incorporate in our submission um, because that so the civil society task force cannot um, collect the input from um, single civil society organization, but um, it, it is organized by region. So uh, please do send if you have uh, input. Um, next slide, please. So um, we came up with a draft regional submission, um, and this submission have two parts. Uh, one is the preamble. Um, mention the general concern and point that we would like to see in the UNGAS document. And then the input from the region is organized in five teams um, as the a, as a, um, as a proposed uh, UNGAS outcome document. Uh, now I'm going through the um, um, these uh, points. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a, a preamble. Um, there's a six different points. I'm not going to go through one by one uh, in the interest of time. Uh, but we did mention the drug-free ASEAN, the concern about that, and, um, and the concern that that drug-free ASEAN declaration had eventually led to a drug war in the region. Um, and um, we call the uh, UNGAS to um, to request the government to repeal repressive and discriminatory policy um, to what people who use drugs. Um, and we also call for um, the UNGAD and the government to have a, to, to change the discord on drug policy um, because we think that the drug, the discord the current discord is not constructive, is not um, evidence informed, etc. And uh, and that process to come up with a um, an informed discord had to be inclusive um, and ensure the participation of all stakeholders, including affected communities, uh, um, community-based organizations, academic, the uh, health and and um, job. Uh, law enforcement, etc. Um, and the the next point is about um, review of the of the um, uh, drug policy, international and national drug policy and laws, uh, to end the wars on drug, to reconsider class classification of drugs, and um, to revise outdated concept um, like uh, the the etiology of drug use, etc. 
um, and um, to um, have a to to uh, encourage the government to have a, a correct and evidence-based understanding of drug situation and national drug policy, and that to be communicated publicly to the population through the health education and, and media. Um, and we also urge UNGAS to endorse um, the increase of national spending um, on uh, harm reduction and evidence-based intervention. Um, we also mentioned that we recognize that in our region there are some harm reduction intervention, but the scale is, is not enough, it's small, and there's also a very little intervention for people who use RTS. Um, so uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, and the last point is about the a full and meaningful participation of civil society and of the community in the drug policy and drug services. So that's a general point. Um, and then we go into five themes. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, that is the the um, the drug and health. Um, so the first team in the in the UNGAS um, document would be drug and health. And um, I think one interesting point that we um, we got from the consultation is about the equalities um, of the of the people who use drugs um, to access to to national health. That is to be linked with the sustainable development goal um, on uh, the goal number three on universal health care. Um, to make sure that people who use drugs have an equal access to healthcare as other people, um, given the um, the global um, uh, uh, development goal, um, and then there are um, other other points on the. Um, um, drug and health, including um, the implementation of the UN, um, so the guideline from the UN agency, um, etc. Um, so I, I am not going um, to go into every detail um, of the of the submission, um, but in general, we the sub the submission for our region is based on the five team um, of the UNGAS outcome document. And many of the uh, issues that um, uh, Anne mentioned, um, like a, a proportionate sentencing, death penalty, um, the access to pain medicine, um, the harm reduction development and indicator to measure success uh, are also addressed in our um, in our submission. Um, the the document is available, and um, if you um, I I have sh I, I have shared with the people who gave input to the to the document, but I can uh, send to you, whoever interested in having a look at it, and give your feedback, if you can send it um, back to me um, very soon, in next 24 hours, uh, let's say. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, maybe later on, um, Juan, can you put my uh, email address so people can write to me if they have, if they want to, if they didn't have the document. Uh, and um, and also for the for the input, um, I think I will end here so um, Simon can speak about uh, South Asia. Thank you. Hello, am I audible? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll be I'll be speaking on the South Asia region. I can't see my slides up yet. Mm, these are still the slides. Uh, uh, I think one had put up. We will need to skip to. But I'm, I'm not going to wait uh, for the slides to come up. And for the South Asia region, um, we had um, overall eight countries, and we got involvement from from six countries. Um, the six countries that we 
we were involved with uh, for the civil society consultation was um, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh and the Maldives. Um, we reached out to other countries in the region, um, however we didn't get uh, much of uh, response from the other countries. Um, for, for the South Asia consultations, uh, I'm not going to repeat uh, the things that Juan had said earlier, um, but to be fair, uh, the Regional Office of South Asia of the UNODC has been really active in the region in, uh, in promoting um, uh, in promoting the UNCAS uh, country dialogues and um, um, recently uh, over the last six months there have been extensive uh, activities that have been happening across the region in different countries uh, for India um, we the UNODC regional office hosted a, a consultation for uh, governments and civil society um, of the region of South Asia and Southwest Asia in September last year and as civil society partners since uh, it was hosted in India a few of us were invited to participate and engage with governments of uh, six countries uh, in, but that included Iran as well. Um, for the regional civil society consultations, the process that we adopted was first to ensure that it was inclusive. Uh, and the way to do that was to reach out to all um, drug-related NGOs and other agencies working, in, uh, working on drugs. So we had inputs from NGOs that were into prevention, uh, uh, harm reduction, treatment, um, as well as from affected community groups all across the region, especially for countries like India um, uh, and Nepal uh, and uh, and Bhutan. We have we have partners who have uh, have community groups of affected populations of people who use drugs, uh, women who use drugs, uh, and family members of people who use drugs. And we in in a, few of the countries across the South Asia region, we also have um, a national drug dependence treatment uh, NGO network. So we reached out to all of these networks across the region in different countries and uh, we've, we've got uh, quite a substantial bit of um, information uh, that contributed to the civil society questionnaire. Um, we organized a regional uh, civil society consultation um, uh, here in New Delhi. Um, just to be clear, on the civil society task force, the way it was mentioned earlier, there are two members from every region. For the South Asian region, is um, it is uh, is also the same. There are two of us. Uh, uh, there was uh, Mr. Pubudu, Sumana Sekara, and myself, um, we both jointly organized the consultation for the six countries. And we ensured that each country was uh, represented by uh, one person from demand reduction or prevention, one person from harm reduction, and at least one person from the affected communities, that is, uh, people um, who are drug users, uh, ex-drug users, current drug users, recovered drug users, uh, uh, people who are women drug users, people who are drug users affected by HIV and hepatitis C, etc. So we ensured there was equal representation from all the communities uh, affected by drugs at that consultation. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of what the recommendations is explicitly uh, focused on, but there, there was, um, there was a, a consensus. As you know, a, a, the region of Asia, it's very difficult to get a consensus on many, many things, especially all of, um, all of the areas uh, under the uh, under UNGAS. But uh, 
we had a couple of themes uh, out of the five that there was a consensus on, and one of that was that uh, drug users should not be criminalized and subjected to um, uh, sentencing and, and, and hard time, etc. So the, this was one major thing that all of the countries at the South Asia consultation agreed to, and it is mentioned explicitly in the recommendation document, which will be finalized over the next two days. Um, for the region of South Asia, there's, there's also this um, this dynamic between uh, demand reduction and harm reduction, and this dynamic is not uh, is a very constructive dynamic in the sense that um, NGOs and, and community groups work together on on both demand reduction as well as harm reduction, and that needs to be encouraged further. Um, we in our region we don't have a. a a huge wall between demand reduction and harm reduction, and, and, and it's it kind of works together, complementing each other, and that is something that uh, is I don't know. It's probably not there in other regions. Um, for um, for the second priority focus for our region, uh, I think it um, it was highlighted there is a need to develop. Uh, effective strategies for for um, for health um, for health uh, prioritization by governments especially for incarcerated populations for women and for young uh, people who use drugs um, in our region the, there are uh, there is a demand for for services for for women and young people who use drugs, and to be fair, um, the UNODC, as I said before, in our region, um, has been pushing governments, uh, especially in, in India, uh, Bhutan, uh, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives, uh, to provide um, access to access to. Uh, drug treatment using control substances like uh, methadone and buprenorphine, and uh, these these uh, programs have have been have been uh, piloted quite successfully in a few of the countries. And um, the the recommendations that came out from the consultation were that there needs to be a greater access to um, to methadone and buprenorphine-based uh, treatment services across the region, um, it, especially uh, significant uh, to the consultation was uh, was the need to have meaningful civil society engagement across the board. Uh, in India, it's safe to say for a couple of countries in the region, for India, for for uh, for Nepal, uh, these are the two countries in the region that have extensive, uh, uh, meaningful participation in in programs, uh, in uh, drug-related programs. Uh, but how, however, for the countries like um, like Sri Lanka, the Maldives, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh. These are the countries that have very limited uh, participation in when it comes to decision making um, on drug-related uh, programs. Um, the uh, the participation from community, from civil society partners, especially for um, uh, for ensuring access to access to much needed services. Uh, not only for drug treatment, but uh, to ensure that HIV and hepatitis C, these are the two um, um, priorities when it comes to ensuring that uh, the drug uh, program is, is comprehensive. Um, for our region, it's not, uh, it's not um, only about drug treatment as a, as a rehabilitation or the addiction or a substitution program. For our region, drugs is significantly um, uh, connected to HIV and hepatitis C, and these are these are things that our governments need to uh, need to highlight for for our region. 
Uh, and when I say highlight, I, I mean investment. There is, there is a need for governments in the region of South Asia to invest more um, in, in, in not only in prevention but in, in harm reduction. Um, there is a significant investment on the part of the government of India. However, uh, I can't say the same for the rest of the countries in the region. The region of South Asia is, uh, is, um, is, is in need of uh, significant investment by government in harm reduction, treatment, in, in care, in ensuring that there are access to services for HIV and Hepatitis C, and that these services um, for uh, criminalized, marginalized, and often street-based, uh, economically challenged groups need to be made free of cost. And this was highlighted during the regional consultation, that all of these um, all of these programs need to be accessible. And the way they can be accessible is if the government rolls them out and ensures that uh, people can access them for free. Um, these were some these were some of the recommendations made uh, from the civil society consultation for South Asia and uh, now you know the real challenges lie at how to engage with governments at the national level for countries in South Asia um, the, the UN support can be leveraged of course uh, but the, beyond that there needs to be a greater uh, greater level of cooperation between civil society and governments when it comes to uh, getting a consensus on strategies and how to make things work. We have a couple of opportunities ahead of us. Um, UNAIDS has, um, has, the, um, um, has uh, prioritized meetings in a few countries in Asia uh, between civil society and government. So these dialogues should be interesting. These dialogues will happen over the next one month. Um, so there will be more in-country dialogues uh, between civil society and government. Also, there are bilateral talks and meetings on drugs over over this quarter. I'm not sure the exact dates when that will happen, but uh, between India, Bangladesh, and Myanmar, we will have an opportunity to engage in bilateral meetings. Uh, of course, there is the SAC summit for our region. Again, these dates are not very clear. We are hoping that this uh, these meetings happen uh, before the young gas. Um, so what we're going to do for, as the civil society rep, uh, we're going to ensure that the recommendations briefing paper will be circulated to all of the countries that participated in the consultation. And uh, we hope that the countries will use this to advocate with their governments. And that's, uh, thank you for listening. That's, that's what I have. Hello? Hello, was I audible? Uh, who's, um, who's going to conclude the... I think there were some questions. Hi, sorry. Hi, it's, yes. it's, hi, sorry, it's Anne again. Um, Anne and Gloria, we just... Um, we, we were on uh, mute. Apologies. No, you can hear me all now, right? Yeah, great. So, um, yeah, so we'll try and address um, some of the questions that um, have come up. And sorry, we're running a little bit over time. I hope you can bear with us for another five minutes um, just so that we, we can conclude. Um, and let me also just say thanks to both um, Simon and to Juan for, um, for making this call, but also for their excellent work and commitment over the last... Um, yeah, many months, in fact, to really try and ensure that the views of civil society from from the Asian region is is um, properly collected and will feed into the broader um, civil society task force recommendations. And just very quickly on that, the process that will happen now is that on Friday, all of the task force members, whether they're regional or thematic, will have to submit the results of their consultation to the task force steering group, and then the task force collectively will come up with a one document that collates all the views from global civil society that will be the task force's submission for the UNGAS. Um, 
And I think the plan is that for all the regional and thematic submissions to be made available online on the website for the task force, which I'll find in a moment and circulate on the YouTube chat um, before I hand over to, to Gloria. Um, just looking down the list of questions, I think, um, I think it's best to hand over to Gloria regarding yeah, what we can do in terms of the... Um, yeah, what civil society here can still do in terms of get, engaging their governments. And, and remember, the UNGAS is just one moment. This work will continue post-UNGAS. Um, so um, all of these points and, and ideas that we're sharing now, I think, are, are valid for, for our work beyond the UNGAS as well. I'm just going to hand over to Gloria. Um, I think we've discussed this a bit earlier on in this webinar um, to map make sure you need to identify who with who in your government is being involved um, in preparations for UNGAS. Um, they're likely to involve a number of ministries from foreign affairs to health to drug control. Um, so you should start identifying that and then who the stakeholders are and who you might be able to reach out to um, and the process of being able to meet with them or ask for a dialogue some things that some CSOs have done in the past um, before annual sessions of the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs is to ask for a meeting before CND um, or after UNGAS, or after CND, sorry. Um, this is something that you could do in the lead up to UNGAS as well, to ask for a pre-UNGAS dialogue with your government involving um, all the government stakeholders. Um, even perhaps international agencies such as UN agencies, um, UNAIDS, UNODC, um, and certainly all the civil society organizations and representatives of affected communities, um, especially people who use drugs, um, to be involved in that dialogue. In January, I, I don't know if this was mentioned earlier, but the outcome document for UNGAS had uh, preparations are already underway uh, for drafting that outcome document that all member states will agree to at UNGAS. Um, and negotiations are expected to start um, on, on a draft um, this month. So now is a critical time um, to engage with your governments um, because they should now have a better idea of what UNGAS is and what their position going into UNGAS will be. The next annual session of the um, Commission on Narcotic Drugs, again, will, as with every year, will be in March in Vienna. Um, and this CND will start on the 14th of March and the 14th, 15th and 16th of March will be dedicated to discussions about preparations for UNGAS. Um, so it's important to try to engage your governments, I'll, I'll, we would suggest. That a lot of um, negotiations on the outcome points. Um, most likely will be decided there, if not almost entirely concluded at CND, um, making I guess more of a symbolic meeting. This is what might happen. So it's important to start engaging now. Um, so I think, I don't know if Juan or Simon have anything else they want to add before we end. Um, no, no, I think that's you have said it. Hello? Am I audible? Yeah. I think. Am I audible? Hi, Simon and Juan. Uh, yes. Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to add something? Um, yeah, I, I just think that um, that we still have we still have enough uh, time and we still have opportunities to engage with uh, with governments uh, at at a national level. You know, civil society can do that. It's just that I'm I was kind of hoping that more and more people get involved and engage with their national governments, especially for the region of South Asia. There, uh, it's it's uh, really complex to get people to engage with governments, people especially people who are um, uh, who are committed to uh, to harm reduction, people who are committed to rights-based approaches, people who are committed to uh, 
um, ensuring that um, that communities are protected. These are these are people who need to get a message so that they can reach out to their governments. And I was hoping that um, IDPC can have like a comprehensive uh, a note. Uh, that can be uh, given to the civil society partners so that they can have some sort of an engagement with their national governments. That's that's yeah. That's that's what I have to say. If someone has to speak next, you have to unmute. Juan, did you have any final comments before we conclude? Um, I, I um, just want to say that it's Simon. We uh, the submission uh, for the regional um, for the civil society uh, society task force input to the UNGAS document um, will be near on Friday. But um, there there be activity to engage from civil society task force to the process um, between now and um, until the UNGAS in in April. So if you have uh, any uh, uh, idea or input or initiative, uh, please. Uh, um, communicate uh, with us, and and we try our best to see how we can um, to influence the process. Um, thank you very much for participating in in this webinar. Thanks IDPC for organizing this. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, Juan. So I'm going to conclude now. And there was one final question that a few people have asked on the um, on the chat which is whether or not in addition to the process from the Civil Society Task Force that we've been discussing, it's worth it to submit directly, if there's a way for NGOs to submit directly inputs into the UNGAS process. Um, obviously the most formal route and the route that actually we'll have, uh, we hope that we'll definitely be taken note of is through the task force, but of course all NGOs and civil society organizations have been invited to submit to make submissions to the UNGAS process um, on the UNGAS website. And if you stay on the if you're interested in that and stay on the Google chat for a moment, we'll share those details with you um, on the on the YouTube, sorry, on the YouTube chat in just a second. We're just looking for them now. But um, I think that's all for now. I'm just checking. Yes, there's an UNGAS formal website and there are loads of submissions already made on that website and I will share the details shortly and you can I'll share the details for the website so you can see what's been submitted and also the process by which you can make submissions um, and yeah I recommend that if you want to make a submission directly there it's good and also if you do make submissions um, and you are making a national level submission you should um, also send it directly to your um, your designated government officials as well so um, you need to find out who from your government most likely the drug control agency will be responsible um, in most cases. Um, they should also receive a copy of your submission. So um, yeah, IDPC remains um, at your disposal. As you know, Gloria is based here in Bangkok and she leads on the Asia Regional Work Program. So do feel free to get in touch with Gloria for comments and questions. Um, and yeah, thank you very much all for joining. Okay, thanks. thanks.